Welcome everybody to the uh, concurrent session today. Before we get started with the session, I have a few details for everybody. Uh, the presentation is 30 minutes with 10 minutes for Q&A. Please be sure to log into the BC Kidney Days event app. That is where you will be entering your questions for the speaker. As well, you can find Dr. St. Jules bio there. If you would like to ask a question, um, tap submit a question now under the live Q&A and uh, type your question and hit submit. I will get to as many questions as I can at the end of the presentation. Along with my co-chair Eileen Carolyn, I am pleased to introduce to you Dr. David, Dr. David St. Jules. He is an extensively published nutrition researcher currently based at the University of Nevada in Reno. Today, he will be providing a background to the nutrient-based development of renal dietary patterns and some of the faulty underlying assumptions that inform restrictions and advice giving to people living with chronic kidney disease. He will make the case for etiology-based diet approaches to managing diet. Well, thank you very much. Uh, very excited to be here. Um, and I'm going to be talking today about the evolution of the renal diet. Um, and is it time for a paradigm shift? And, and I'm going to be discussing some of the um, interesting changes and uh, things that have been going on with the uh, diet for kidney disease um, in the last few years in particular. Um, so if the overall objectives of this presentation to examine the scientific premise and rationale for the nutrient-based approach, um, and I will explain what the nutrient-based approach is in a second. Uh, and then we'll discuss some of the other determinants of these diet-related complications in people's CKD and explain why it is that that's sort of bringing up this question of whether the nutrient-based approach is the optimal approach for preventing these complications. In terms of conflicts, uh, I was a co-principal investigator on a, a trial from Relips Inc. who makes the potassium binders, uh, Paterimer, uh, but I will not be talking about potassium binders this presentation. Uh, so first of all, I just want to introduce you to what I'm referring to as the nutrient-based renal diet. And this approach to designing a diet is very familiar to uh, anyone with background in nutrition because it's how we sort of determine uh, the diet for healthy populations. So what we do is we figure out what the offending nutrient is. And you can see here, I'm focused on three of the common problems that we see in CKD that are diet-related, hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, and protein energy wasting, or PEW. And, and we often attribute these complications to specific nutrients. Um, from there, you establish a nutrient prescription, which I will show you on the next slide, and then, uh, then the hard part of translating that into a dietary pattern. And obviously, um, this approach has assumptions built in all the way through this that can create problems. Um, so here's an example of a nutrition prescription. Um, and you can see here uh, the key nutrients that are typically discussed in the renal diet is the potassium, phosphorus, and protein. Um, it, also sodium, but I, I haven't included that here because that doesn't affect specific food choices. So it doesn't affect the dietary balance and variety. Um, so if this is the prescription here, and you can see the big difference between the pre-dialysis and the hemodialysis, the protein um, has a big jump there in terms of higher protein requirements in hemodialysis. So um, in terms of translating this into specific foods, uh, if we sort of, these are the different food groups here, our fruits and vegetables group um, is primarily focused on uh, potassium. So avoiding the high potassium fruits and vegetables. Um, the recommendation is to limit whole grains to manage phosphorus, limit dairy to reduce potassium and phosphorus intake, and then limit nuts, seeds, and legumes to uh, manage potassium phosphorus, but then also consume protein with every meal. So lots of animal-based protein in order to make sure that you're meeting your protein needs. And this, again, this is the hemodialysis diet. So again, the higher protein requirements. Um, and you can see here, just looking generally at this diet, it's, it's not an overly, what we would <laughs> typically classify as like a healthy eating pattern. This is a fairly unhealthy eating pattern, but the idea is, again, these complications necessitate it in order to uh, meet those nutrient prescriptions. So the uh, nutrient-based approach has certain assumptions in it. And what the main assumption or the main um, thing that they focus on is that these metabolic disorders like hyperkalemia are primarily caused by the corresponding nutrient. So within that assumption, there's an assumption of causality. So the idea is that other dietary factors are relatively unimportant. If you can design the diet just based on potassium, um, then the other factors must be relatively unimportant in terms of determining hyperkalemia risk. 
Um, and the other thing that's sort of built into this is this concept of equivalence, the idea that um, if we know the crude amount of a nutrient in a food, then we can classify it as high or low, um, and that um, you know, differences in bioavailability don't matter um, uh, in terms of how much actually gets absorbed, and we know that that's not necessarily true. Um, so before I, I get into sort of the potential problems in the, in the diet, I want to discuss where the rationale came from in terms of designing the diet this way, because this has been the, the dietary pattern for the last 60 years. So why are we all of a sudden discussing this change? So if we look at hyperkalemia, the discussion around hyperkalemia starts in the early 1900s, um, where they found that if they infused uh, patients, just normal patients with high doses of potassium, that it could cause uh, a lot of problems like loss of consciousness. Um, and if you look at the 20s to 40s, uh, period, uh, actually high potassium diets were recommended for their alkalinity um, as a way of managing metabolic acidosis. And potassium salts were actually used as diuretics. So um, large doses of potassium is provided um, or recommended for CKD in the sort of 20s to 40s. Um, but then in the 1940s, we started to see these studies which showed that patients with chronic kidney disease have reduced dietary potassium tolerance. And let's take a look at what this looks like. Oh, sorry. The uh, one thing I just want to note is that um, heading out of the 1950s, the overall consensus was that um, too much potassium in the forms of potassium salts, like potassium nitrate, which was used for uh, diuresis, um, were, should not be used in, in patients who are elite uric or aneuric, um, but there was no real mention of dietary potassium. And this is sort of one of those impaired dietary potassium studies. And you can see here, they took patients who either were oliguric or patients who were healthy controls, and they gave them a large dose of potassium in a fasted state. And you can see in the, in the normal subjects, they, they had a, a mild rise in serum potassium levels, but they didn't really go that high above, this is 5.4 here. Um, if you look over at the CKD patients, they started off higher than 5.4, but they had very dramatic increases in their serum potassium levels. Um, and this is that impaired dietary potassium tolerance. So this has been these findings have been replicated a lot. It's, it's very clear that in the postprandial state, dietary potassium um, is, is poorly handled in people with chronic kidney disease. In terms of recommending a low potassium diet, that actually came out of the 1960s um, when they were trying to give these patients very low protein diets, and that was a way of preventing uremia. And uh, so we can see here, this is a study where they took 20 patients with chronic renal failure. They had very low GFRs or elevated blood urea nitrogens. And um, so they were using this modified Giovanetti diet, which is a, a very low nitrogen diet. And you can see the diet is actually pretty low in potassium as well. It's in the lower end of that recommended range. And what they found is that hyperkalemia was a common complication in this population. You can see their potassium levels went up. Um, and, and so what they suggested is that if you have hyperkalemia developing in these patients, that you can uh, manage it by going even lower with the dietary potassium or giving them a potassium binding agent. So um, a subsequent study, which is built on this study, um, used a similar approach. So again, that very low nitrogen diet. And again, the purpose of the study was to uh, reduce uremia and uremic symptoms, not to look at uh, potassium, but they did measure the potassiums. And um, so very low protein diet um, over a very long period of time. They had this um, built into their protocol based on that prior study, um, suggesting that if a patient developed hyperkalemia, they would put them on that very low potassium diet. And um, what they found is that when they put the patients on these um, low nitrogen diets, that a lot of them developed hyperkalemia, all but two, so 32 out of 34, um, despite the fact that the potassium intake was not that high in the diet. And if you look at us, this is a subset of patients where they measured urinary potassium. And so that's a, a, a fairly good measure of um, dietary potassium exposure. You can see that dietary potassium exposure went dramatically down when they were put on these diets, um, but the serum potassium levels went up. And, and you can see here, this is one of the conclusions of the authors, says the hyperkalemia was not related to excess potassium intake. But what was interesting is this is actually following this time in the 1960s, um, the low potassium diet was the approach used um, for managing hyperkalemia and, and continues to be to this day. Um, so that's the evidence really in favor of potassium and hyperkalemia. It's really that uh, postprandial uh, state. It's the strongest evidence. And we haven't really tested it um, since then. Um, if we look at the low phosphorus diet, the focus there is on mineral and bone disorders, and the evidence is a lot more clear. And you can see there's, uh, in the animal studies, there's very strong mechanistic data linking dietary phosphorus intake to the changes that we associate with mineral and bone disorders. Um, so this one's looking at parathyroid hormone, and what they did is they just, if they give the uh, rats that have the uh, kidney disease 
very, very low phosphorus intakes, they can prevent the um, hyperparathyroidism. And this is, these sorts of findings have been replicated a lot in animal models. models. It's, it's a lot more difficult than humans because obviously it's very difficult to get a patient to a very, this low of a, of a phosphorus intake, but clearly higher, higher intakes of phosphorus um, do drive a lot of the uh, problems we see with CKD and BD. Um, those mineral and bone disorders. Um, the one sort of major change that's occurred in, in the history of the of this story is the concept of bioavailability. Um, so uh, we know that plant-based phosphorus is less bioavailable than uh, animal-based. And the other thing that's sort of come onto the, the scene here is the focus on phosphate additives, um, which can be an important source of dietary phosphorus intake. Um, if we look at the overall guidelines, um, it's pretty good evidence. So 1B evidence um, recommending that phosphorus intake be lowered in individuals with hyperphosphatemia as a way of, man, of bringing that back down into the normal range. Um, and there's some good evidence to support that. Um, the story for uh, protein energy wasting and protein intake is, is um, uh, it's closer to the story of potassium, a lot less evidence um, in terms of supporting this. So um, initially, uh, this was related primarily to avoiding uh, uremic symptoms and slowing the progression of CKD, this low protein diet. And again, this is in the starting off in the pre-dialysis era. So this is all pre-dialysis. And so in the 1800s, it was sort of thought that excess meat was work for the kidneys and that that um, in turn resulted in uh, accelerated decline of kidney function. Um, and in actual, in the, in the early 1900s, there was a lot of animal studies demonstrating this to be true. Um, and so the idea was that if you lower the protein intake, you could you reduce the uremia, which would alleviate the symptoms. Um, and that um, idea of being able to reuse the urea in the body to make amino acids um, really became popularized in the 50s and 60s. Um, and during that time, there was an interesting observational finding. I just sort of brought this up here to, to discuss an important phenomenon, um, which is the hyperfiltration hypothesis. And it's a trade-off. Um, and the idea is that when you, at least in the short term, if you give a person a high protein intake, their GFR actually typically improves. And the reason is, is that the amino acids um, actually uh, cause hyperfiltration of the kidneys. And so that hyperfiltration lowers the eGFR. However, um, it does so in, in the form of a trade-off. It puts stress on the individual nephrons and it can actually accelerate the, um, the loss of nephrons. And so um, although in the short term, a higher protein intake results in a, in a better GFR, in the long term, we know that that's not true and that um, this is actually just a uh, hyperfiltration um, that's actually damaging the nephrons. Um, and I mentioned previously the Giovanetti diet, the Giardano diet, that's another um, way of referring to that. They're basically those low nitrogen diets and they're based on the idea that is fairly well proven at this point that um, the blood urea nitrogen can be recycled to make non-essential amino acids. And so by providing a very low protein intake, you can actually lower the blood urea nitrogen and the corresponding uh, uremic symptoms. Um, the one thing that sort of really changed this scene was the introduction of dialysis because um, that uh, that changed a lot of things, but one of the things that it did is it really increased the protein requirements because um, dialysis uh, removes additional protein, and also they're in a, in a much worse state in terms of um, being further along in, in their disease progression. So in terms of research evidence, so where did that number come from for the prescription? It, this is one of the main studies that was used, and, and you can see the study was an older study, um, and it was a controlled feeding study, crossover feeding study for three weeks at a time. There was no washout period, but um, so they took six patients and they put them on three different energy levels, giving them the exact same amount of protein. And so the idea is that if you're in energy balance, which people at the 35 level, 35 kcals per kg per day should be, that in some of these patients, 1.1 to 1.2 grams did not prevent negative nitrogen balance. Um, and so the thinking was, well, in order to be safe, um, we should recommend at least this amount of protein in order to prevent negative nitrogen balance. Um, it's a fairly small study sample, and there's, there's some interesting um, within this study um, things to note. Um, but, but this is kind of where, where the basis for the higher protein intakes um, came from. Um, the other thing that sort of comes along with the protein recommendations um, that I just want to mention briefly is this concept of high uh, biological value protein. So um, one of the recommendations within um, CKD is that 50% should come from high biological value sources. And when we say high biological value sources, we're mostly referring to animal-based protein foods. 
Um, there are some exceptions, but mostly that's how it's interpreted. Um, <clears throat> so um, this recommendation actually came out of those very low nitrogen diets that were done in the 60s. Um, the idea was that when you're giving somebody 20 grams of protein a day, that it's really important to make sure that the protein that they get has the essential amino acids. And so it makes sense to focus on high biological value proteins to make sure that they're not deficient in any amino acids. However, the adaptation to HD diet where the, the protein intakes are much higher has not actually been tested. Um, and it may not be equally applicable. So a person consuming 1.1 gram of protein per kilogram body weight per day is probably unlikely to be missing essential amino acids if they're, if they're meeting that protein intake and getting it from uh, varied sources. And this is just a quote from Dr. Koppel's uh, paper um, that came out around the time of the last guidelines, which recommended that high uh, protein, high biological value diet. And we can see here, uh, we have recommended without testing this question experimentally that about 50% should be high biological value. And you can see here, this, this wording here is, it implies that this was not really based on evidence. It was just prudent to sort of try to prevent protein entry wasting, but we don't actually know that the emphasis on high biological value actually achieves that in the, in the dialysis population. So just to summarize this section, um, uh, just to reiterate what I've gone over. So the, uh, the renal diet or the CKD diet um, was developed using a nutrient-based approach, which is similar to what was done for the Canadian uh, Dietary Guidelines, Eating Well with a Canada's Food Guide. Um, it assumes that the nutrient-based disorders, such as hyperkalemia, are related to the corresponding nutrients. So hyperkalemia is caused by eating too much potassium, um, hyperphosphatemia, too much phosphorus, and then protein energy wasting, not enough protein. Um, with the exception of phosphorus, the premise and rationale for the nutrient prescription, so the ones for potassium and protein, were, were based on very limited evidence. The ones for phosphorus um, were, were supported by more strong evidence, I will say. So now that I've sort of gone over how those recommendations sort of came about, what are some of the problems with them? And I'm going to start off with the low potassium diet for managing hyperkalemia. So as I mentioned, um, the low potassium diet for hyperkalemia focuses on uh, primarily the fruits and vegetables. So limiting those high potassium fruits and vegetables like oranges, bananas, tomatoes, potatoes. Um, but also included within that is limiting dairy products and avoiding nut seeds and legumes. So uh, the problem with this um, recommendation is that the overall assumption doesn't actually appear to be supported by the evidence. So this is a cross-sectional study that um, we did where we looked at uh, serum potassium levels of hemodialysis patients in relation to their potassium intake. And you can see there's no real association there. And this, this finding has been replicated, um, but there's some other evidence I'm just gonna point out on the side here. Um, so um, vegetarian studies comparing vegetarian and non-vegetarian patients do not show uh, worse, pro, um, I'm sorry, worse potassium status. Um, the diets that I mentioned from the 1960s, those low nitrogen diets were lower in potassium, but they tended to increase serum potassium levels. Um, there have been uh, a couple studies where they've given um, fruits and vegetables to patients with CKD who didn't have a history of hyperkalemia. And in those studies, the additional potassium did not result in higher uh, serum potassium levels. Um, I've already sort of pointed out this one right here. This is sort of demonstrated by the graph. There's, they're not associated with each other. Um, and then higher potassium knowledge. So patients who know which foods are low in potassium and high in potassium doesn't necessarily predict serum potassium levels. So um, suggesting that that information doesn't appear to be helping them avoid hyperkalemia. And part of the reason why that may be is that although the uh, low potassium diet obviously addresses dietary potassium as a risk factor for hyperkalemia, as I mentioned, the diet itself is not very healthy and um, there are other things that may affect serum potassium levels um, that would be actually um, problematic on a low potassium diet. So I've sort of gone through some of the main factors here. So some factors that can determine serum potassium levels are metabolic acidosis, insulin resistance, low stool output, um, low sodium potassium ATPase activity. The sodium potassium ATPases are the transporters that um, move potassium intracellularly, um, particularly in the postprandial state. And then higher potassium bioavailability associated with um, uh, sorry, lower potassium bioavailability associated with um, higher fiber. So there's a lot of potential factors that can affect um, this relationship. And, and we can see that if you look at the actual diet therapy that would achieve this, the low acid diet is very high in potassium and low in protein. Um, diet for managing insulin resistance is a diabetic diet, which would be lower in protein um, and um, uh, would be incorporating some of those healthier food choices. 
Um, obviously, fiber and potassium are highly correlated. I, I mentioned most of those food sources that are restricted are, are plant-based. Um, and then uh, we do know that, and this is sort of you know, beyond the talk, uh, scope of this talk, but high potassium diets in, increase the activity of these sodium potassium ATPases and help to prevent um, postprandial hyperkalemia. And then, and then lastly, I mentioned already, dietary fiber may, may lower the bioavailability of dietary potassium. That hasn't been proven yet, but we do know that high fiber diets are associated with increased stool output of potassium. Um, <clears throat> so that's the potassium story. Um, the, the low phosphorus story is much more simple, as I mentioned. So again, the, the focus is on three food groups, so limiting whole grains, limiting dairy, and then um, those nut seeds and legumes. And the biggest issue with this one appears to be this difference in bioavailability. Um, and so you can see here, these uh, are CKD patients with EGFRs 25 to 40, and they were either um, put on this, uh, in this crossover feeding study, they, they were fed a meat diet or a vegetarian diet. And you can see that when they were on the meat diet, their serum phosphorus levels were much higher, despite the fact that the diets were matched on the amount of phosphorus. And so this is a, a pretty well-established story at this point, the idea that plant-based phosphorus is less bioavailable. Um, than the animal based. And so it's that, that concept of equivalence is not met. And so that brings up some problems in terms of um, you know, whether or not, particularly in the um, plant-based versus animal-based protein, whether those trade-offs are in fact beneficial. Um, and then finally, I just want to mention sort of the high protein diet for preventing um, protein energy wasting. And this is primarily focused on those animal-based protein foods, those high biological value uh, sources. So um, the problem with this one is that there's the malnutrition in CKD, and particularly in advanced CKD, doesn't appear to be driven by the fact that patients are avoiding high-protein foods. If you compare uh, the dietary patterns of patients on hemodialysis versus healthy controls, which has been done, the percent of calories from protein is, is roughly the same. And so they don't appear to be necessarily eating much lower um, protein diets. Their protein um, intakes are pretty normal. They appear to be not eating enough calories, which is a completely different problem. Part of the reason why they're not eating enough calories is because CKD is associated with hypermetabolism and hypercatabolism. And um, so, you know, although obviously inadequate protein intake can contribute to malnutrition, the evidence supporting this dietary pattern that focuses on getting more protein as a way of managing is really limited. And uh, what I've done here is I've just put together a graph that's, this isn't real data, this is just thinking about the problem a bit. Um, and so we know that in normal, healthy individuals, um, there's this sort of this uh, parabolic curve of protein utilization. As protein intake goes up, um, protein utilization sort of plateaus when you get close to the protein requirements. And when, when proteins aren't used for you know, normal protein uses, they get metabolized. They get metabolized uh, for energy um, and for storage purposes. Um, but the problem is, is that if you think about it, um, those metabolic derangements that drive protein energy wasting, so uremia, metabolic acidosis, inflammation, those factors that are sort of driving uh, the problem, they're actually also related to protein intake. And you can think during the um, low protein intakes, um, most of the amino acids are being used for, to make proteins. And so as a result, there's not much metabolic byproducts. However, as your protein intake goes higher, and particularly once you've already met the protein needs, additional protein is going to get metabolized. It's going to produce urea. It's going to produce uh, sulfuric acid and hydrochloric acid. It's going to produce um, additional inflammation through those gut-derived uremic toxins. Um, so there's, in, in essence, um, there's a point, and, there's, uh, and figuring out exactly where this point is and how it fits in the context of diet is, is um, still a problem that's being figured out. But there is a point where additional protein is not going to drive uh, protein anabolism. If anything, it's going to contribute to these metabolic derangements that uh, make it difficult to meet the protein needs. And so, um, and this is particularly true with these animal-based protein foods, which are um, very high in protein, um, which is good um, in terms of making sure you're meeting your needs. But once you've met your needs, additional protein um, is probably not going to necessarily be beneficial. And so um, yeah, this, this is kind of the, the relationship I wanted to sort of discuss there. Happy to, and I, I think it's an interesting one we can talk about more um, after this uh, talk. So um, overall, that's, that's my presentation. So the conclusions are that uh, many of the assumptions underlying the nutrient-based renal diet aren't necessarily supported by the scientific literature. 
um, the focus on a low potassium, low phosphorus, high protein diet in the in the particular the hemodialysis guidelines, it, it's not clear that those that that dietary pattern will actually lower the risk of hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, and malnutrition. Um, and um, I, I think what's coming out of this, and and what I hope to talk to talk about a bit more, is is that an etiology based approach that sort of looks at the, the causal factors may be superior in terms of managing these complications, particularly for hyperkalemia and protein energy wasting, where um, other factors are known to be important determinants of those problems. So that's my presentation. Here are my uh, references. Uh, and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions and have a discussion a bit about this. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're just going to wait for Dr. St. Jules to join us on the webinar. I'm only seeing two questions on the app. So if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask the speaker, please uh, sign in to the app and post your questions um, in the event, please. Sorry about that, I was muted. Um, I've got a couple questions um, waiting. We're uh, just waiting for the speaker to come back with us. Um, so I'll read out these questions. And then if you have some other questions, maybe you can post those in the app for us. What approach do you suggest we take to support a patient who arrives at dialysis with a potassium of 6.5? I think this is pretty common occurrence for all of us, especially around blood work week. So um, I look forward to hearing the answer to that. Um, is there an optimum timing for exercise to address postprandial hyperkalemia? And uh, Mish, this sort of is similar to your question, um, touching on looking at postprandial potassium similarly to blood sugar. So um, I think that's a great question you have there. And there's another one on oral nutrition supplements designed for people treated with hemodialysis. These are typically high in protein and high calorie should we consider a primarily high calorie supplement for some patients? I think that's a great question as well. Um, I know myself, uh, the practice tends to be focusing on the protein, but um, I think looking at the calories is essential as well. Unfortunately, I can't see everybody um, in the meeting, but uh, yeah, I would just like to say uh, I really enjoyed the session today. Um, I really think that what, what we've heard today and yesterday during the professional breakout session is practice changing for us. And I really look forward to see how we can evolve our practice here in BC and uh, how that can translate into uh, success and uh, new information for the patients. That's okay. Hi, Dr. St. Jules. Um, we finished your presentation and uh, getting lots of great questions for that. Um, I'm just going to scroll through them and see um, which ones we've got here. Here's one um, I thought that was particularly interesting. Um, oral nutrition supplements designed for people treated with hemodialysis are typically high protein and high calorie. Should we consider a primarily high calorie supplement for some patients? Well, this is a really interesting question. Um, I would uh, think that the high protein, high energy is okay in in the in the hemodialysis patient population. Um, I um, would imagine in this scenario like that, that would be in a patient who is not eating well, and so uh, my guess is is that having both the energy and the protein would probably be beneficial. If, if there, I could imagine a scenario where it might be a bit excessive. Um, if, if a patient was otherwise healthy, but if they're all they're consuming in their diet is enteral formula, um, or, you know, if they're getting mostly energy from enteral formulas and things like that, um, you know, what is the overall metabolic state of the body and what are the protein needs, I think would be the question. And I, um, I it would depend on the patient, but I, I could see a scenario where high protein is appropriate. Actually, I think that would be most commonly the appropriate in a hemodialysis, but um, I could see a scenario where a lower protein might be appropriate if they were getting protein elsewhere. Okay. You may not know about our BC Renal Agency formulary, so we're able to provide nutrition supplements free of charge, and we do have quite an array that would suit various um, requirements. Okay. Another question that's coming up, there's a couple uh, variations of this, is some more um, information on exercise and postprandial K. 
um, I guess if I could combine two, one is, is there an optimal time for that similarly to people with um, high postprandial blood sugars? And also what is a good motivator for clients? Uh, well, I think the motivator itself is the protection against the unseen hyperkalemia. So that hyperkalemia that occurs not um, in that postprandial state is sort of the incentive because uh, we don't typically measure the postprandial state. So there's that risk of hyperkalemia. And if exercise works in the way that it may work, and we don't know yet, um, <laughs> I have a grant under review to look at this, then um, then it would theoretically protect, provide some additional protection in addition to the other benefits of exercise. Um, now, in terms of when to do it, there was only one study that found a reduction in sodium potassium. That was a study by Scott et al. And that was provided on non-dialysis days. If you look at what is recommended by the uh, uh, Sports Medicine College, I can't remember the exact name of it, they recommend non-dialysis days as well. Although I do know that there are more uh, research studies that look at intradialytic exercise in terms of getting the benefits. Um, those are primarily, I think, mostly seen on non-dialysis days, but there's no reason to suspect that, for example, upregulation of the sodium potassium ATPases would not occur, occur um, also if it was intradialytic. It just hasn't been looked at at all, as far as I know. Okay. Um, I am going to try to squeeze in one more question. Um, and I will I will answer all <laughs> questions that you have. You can just email me. I'm really sorry about that. I don't know how I got, I got up by one hour. So. Oh, that is no worries. That is no worry. Um, I think one that the pressing question, I guess, would be which blood work do you see as most relevant when checking protein? I'm thinking she means protein energy nutrition status. Uh, yesterday, you commented that low albumin might be less important. Do you prefer bun or urine urea outputs or other? I mean, if you, if you had a, a pre-dialysis patient, the ure, urea, urea nitrogen would be, I, I think, probably your best estimate of protein exposure. Um, in the dialysis patient population, I think that's obviously a little bit more difficult. I'd be looking at the normalized protein catabolic rate, or you could look at, if you don't get that in your facility, look at the pre-dialysis blood urea nitrogens as an indication of uh, protein exposure. Unfortunately, it's not a straight linear relationship. You can't just look at the blood urea nitrogen and know how much uh, protein that patient is taking. So um, I, I would not use albumin. Albumin, um, there's actually, uh, for anyone who's unaware, uh, American Society of Parental Nutrition, Nutrition uh, had a paper just came out by Evans, um, and in that paper, they specifically talk about albumin. And it's a very nice review article where they discuss this idea that albumin is a disease biomarker. Um, and uh, it's important in nutrition assessment, but not because it's an indication of malnutrition. So that was, I thought, I thought a very nicely written paper and a good one to check out if you're interested in this topic. Okay, thank you so much. Um, just during this whole planning session with myself and Eileen, you've been uh, a wealth of knowledge for us and uh, so supportive in our endeavor to bring you to Canada, even if it's uh, by yeah. Zoom. <laughs> yeah, good to be back. Yeah, thanks. Uh, unfortunately, it's virtual, but thank you for inviting me here again. You're welcome. Um, again, you've, you've, you've missed sort of my um, conclusion earlier, but yeah, you've given us a lot to think about, and I think you'll see us changing our practice, and we already have a meeting um, sort of idea for a meeting plan to, to address um, at least our potassium approach. So mm -hmm. um, in conclusion, I'd like to thank you for this enlightening presentation. And I would like to thank everybody for participating and watching and being part of today. Um, lunch is up next. Um, we have a cooking demonstration by the um, um, a, a duo from Victoria. And uh, I think you'll be entertained by them. And that will start at 11.35 um, via the live webcast link at the top of the schedule in the event app. So enjoy everybody and enjoy the rest of today. And if anyone has any questions for me, um, I will uh, make myself available and answer all questions. I'll follow up. Sorry again about being late. Um, and enjoy the rest of the, the uh, presentation conference. Thanks. Thank you, David. Bye, everyone. Bye.